All right. Good evening, guys. Ken of Tortoise Capital. This is the strategy report and podcast for uh, July 21st, 2020. Thanks for your patience. So let's just jump right into it today uh, and see what we got going on. So just to set the stage a little bit. So last week um, we had generally a, a large volatile five-day series featuring a sell-off and then really four days of recovery with declining volatility in here. And then Monday, um, almost no gap and a strong move up to make a new 10-day high. And today, uh, it pushed higher again uh, to a new, you know, the high a day made a new 10-day high and a new 30-day high. Uh, couldn't hold and then pulled back to recover uh, basically at yesterday's high of the day. So I take that that price and the RL10 price, which is also the RL10 peak, um, to be a pretty strong upward move. And we closed just above the previous peak RL270 long-term for value. So just to put that into perspective, where we are right now, SPY. So uh, this last peak that we had uh, before the big melt off, right? Why I think this is significant. What we had previously was a peak uh, RL two seventy uh, right about there. Um, So this was that peak. And now we've come uh, we've come back to it, which makes this peak divergence. Um, you know, the uh, from the point of maximum maximum divergence here. This this tells you a lot about how price works. you take a look at the uh, length of time that it took to collapse to the peak versus how long it took um, to achieve, you know, a return to that long-term normal. You get something like that. I was told there would be no math. Yes, there is. So now if we just took that and roughly made it into thirds, I 
I don't know if that's quite correct, but you know, that's pretty close. So from 325 down to the belly at uh, 225, so that's 100, that's 100 points. So that means plus 33. So that should be 25 and 33, 258. That's pretty close. That's about one third. So that should be about 290. Yeah, so that's um, that's kind of interesting. To recover the first one third, oops. Yeah, so to recover the first one third took less time than it took to fail the whole the whole piece. And then the second one third. It took that long. Um, I'm going to split the difference in there. Yeah, about that long. And then that final third has taken, you know, one, two, three, almost four times as long in that grind to make up that final third. Um, and if we were going to just you know that first third that second third and that final piece so this should tell you something about the um the importance of extremes the importance of extremes so this one shows you that that first sell-off uh, was wicked harsh and lasted like, you know, five or six days. And then the recovery took about, uh, I would say roughly 10 or 12 days to make that up, that first bounce. Could almost look at it like this. Yeah. Actually, if I'm being honest, it's, it's probably more like this, isn't it? So what this should tell you is that that first move out of those major turning points is incredibly important. And in the first case, where we have the breakdown, uh, you know, that first breakdown, second breakdown, third breakdown, and then the first recovery, the second recovery, and the third recovery. You know the uh, the two extreme conditions. The first, the the shock and loss in number one uh, is mirrored by the shock and gain in time period four, and then that middle that middle period of loss, if I put it that way. Whoops. Let's get rid of that. I really want to correlate this. You notice that the that the gains in four took twice as long as the gain as the losses in one. The gains in five 
took twice as long as the losses. Um, maybe if I can put this up a little higher, yeah. As the losses in two, and then the losses in three. That final harsh crash. That's the one that really caught people unawares. That loss in three. The loss in two and the loss in one. So when you look at one, two, and three, the initial shock was horrible. And uh, and that lost so much in five days. And it took um, it took 10 days to recover that when it hit, finally hit that bottom and came out of four. That's what I want to show right there. And then uh, the losses in two took about 10 days. And then the gains in five took about 20 days. And then the losses in three took five days. So one and three both shared that, that horrible experience um, of major losses in short periods of time. And, uh, and so the loss in three, the third series of losses, even that was brutal and took less time than even the sharp gains in four. That's how bad three was. And then five uh, took half again as long as four and or at the lot, the gains in six, I should say. Pardon me for thinking out loud like this, but it just strikes me as it needs to be said. So the, um, you know, the, gain, the gains in four took twice as long as the losses in one. The losses in two, which were brutal if you had this little rebound and then fail, it took twice as long to gain that much back in five, which took three times as long as the gains in four. So it was already kind of slowing down. And then these gains in six have just been miserable and took, you know, basically twice as long as four and five combined to gain that last third, which just now brings us back to that peak long-term fair value of the RL270. And notice that the RL270 you know, it's it's uh, it's peak loss occurs over here. It's basically right there. You know, so if I was going to, I should probably draw that as a a purple line, just so you get a feel for these dynamics. So this this describes, in my view, the um, you know the conceptual diagram of that regression line fractal framework. There's a geometrical element to all of this. So a couple points to make. Number one, the the sell offs uh, take one fifth of the time to go from one to three. You know, from the from the collapse of the dragon right here, that collapsing dragon when fair value collapsed. It takes five times that long to recover back to the previous, you know, peak fair value, which happened today. All right. And then inside of these, um, these are almost uniform loss series that the losses occur over a five day period. In this case, there was almost that little rebound, which happened fast. There was about a five day to recover this and then another five days to here. 
and then five more days down to, to sell off there. So maybe a total of uh, 20, 20 days of sell off, maybe, yeah, from February 24th to about um, March 25th. You know, that's 30 calendar days. That's about 20 market days. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. It takes twenty days for that sell off to occur, and probably takes you know a hundred days for it to recover. Now, what we're interested in the uh, in the when we're doing regression line fractal framework is this notion of that's that blue line talks about how strong the traders were that could pull the RL10 which was here in that magic moment the RL10 and the RL270 were co-located and they were able to pull it that far in the time that they could pull it that far the RL270 only moved from here to here I should probably put another another circle in there right so we can get a sense of you know how what the absolute value of the sell-off really was and then that rl270 is just kind of relentless and slow and at the its peak sell-off um where by the time it it kind of um it flattened out that's how much it sold off So the, the loss in the RL270 was only from like 3, 325-ish to 298, so maybe $27. So that's about a, only a 10% um, sell-off for those long-term buy and holders. And then in this last little bit in the blue, it's really just been basically kind of flat. It's still, you know, $23 below, you know, in terms of this, in terms of this recovery to get back to where price is now. But in the meantime, the RL10 has come up and, uh, and basically linked up with the RL270 again. So it's back in the station. Um, and then you'll notice that the RL 90 is in there in the RL30. We're basically in a super pinch right in here. We've come into a pretty tight collection of the of the regression lines. Um, you could argue, um, you know, that the um, that the super pinch probably occurred. Oops, sorry. I'd probably argue the super pinch happened inside here. But now essentially the, the recovery from the oversold is done. And now this is a fresh market. Now the question really is, um, does it come back? come back here to the peak that's the, kind of the next move and what in the world is the justification for that when you take a look at the current economic conditions and the uh, the risks to the economies going ahead and the economic global slowdown in what world does this does this price look correct that's the you know the the great mind split that's going on right now and how, so if that's where it's going to go, how do you get this next move here and recognize that that is a, you know, a move to this, uh, a breakout of the previous Z3. That's just, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to fathom that. You know, these are, these are uh, uncertain times. That's just, uh, Spectacular. But I want you to notice that the sell-off is pretty much uniform 
you know, five to seven days of crushing movements when all the pain occurs. Then the first rebound from oversold, that was phone calls were being made, say, we're going to pump as much money as it takes. The second wave comes in to say, yeah, well, maybe it's true. And then the third wave of latecomers to the game trying to get trying to get in and try to make sense of this and whistling past the graveyard. So the sell-offs occur in uniform chunks, and each one of those is about a 10%, a 10% haircut. Yeah. Um, off the original, off the original collapse. But then the the rebound, the um, this tells you that fear is about three to five times stronger than greed. And now we're just about looking at the fourth and fifth mouse coming in right now. Like, like who hasn't bought yet? There's, there's got to be tons of money that hasn't been bought yet. And who's going to buy it? And what are they going to buy? Why would you, would you buy energy right now? Would you buy finance? Would you buy basic materials? Would you buy tech? Those are the four sectors we want to talk about. Why would you buy tech, XLK, for example? Well, because you think you have a 10 to 20 year time horizon that, that all future global productivity is going to increasingly come from those guys and innovation. That's the justification for Tesla and Nikola and Nikola Motors and uh, Virgin Galactic and Twitter, Amazon and Google. There's a quiet argument for the chip makers, so take your pick between Intel and NVIDIA or just split the difference. I'd go with NVIDIA, I think, because gaming, what's everybody going to do with their time off and free government money? Play games. What do they need? Video chips. Who makes video chips? NVIDIA. And they need operating systems to run, so that's Microsoft and Apple. And devices to play, that's Apple and Sony. And Apple, if they bring manufacturing back to the states, that's who. That's where the money needs to go is into uh, made in the USA game devices. And so Apple is sort of stealing the march on that already. Um, it's the National Republican Congressional Committee that thinks I'm a Republican. Colin. How silly are they? So that's the argument for tech. Uh, materials, XLB. Why would you buy that? Well, you think that they're so dramatically on sale that any rebuilding of the global enterprise is going to require those companies. That's a harder sell than XLK because those guys have so much debt and so much capital infrastructure. The only argument there is that if, if you saw a return to basic infrastructure to rebuild cities and roads for resilient and green technology. That would be an area where XLB could work. XLE, energy. Wow, that's a hard one. Uh, because uh, if there's a global economic slowdown, then all of the estimates of energy demands go way down. If there's a genuine move towards green and sustainable, unless those same companies get into energy, that's a tough one. So that, So the argument for that energy sector is watch PBW, the clean energy ETF. So you don't have to pick the winner. You just got to pick PBW. And then if you wanted to specialize in clean energy of the future, you could look at the components and then start a long-term project for studying the energy sector and specializing it. I think that's smart because no matter who wins the building of it, the basic sourcing of the energy solutions got to come from there. And that's kind of what Tesla, Tesla is secretly a green energy storage company. And Elon's pretty smart because he's going to talk about, he hasn't said it yet, but imagine the next scam that he introduces is space-based solar collectors that beam lasers from his satellites to ground stations 
I mean, he got people to buy into the boring company, which is smoke and mirrors. So his next scheme, and he's launching the um, the internet connection satellite services, and he's got SpaceX to put that stuff up there. That's the next scam, is space-based energy collecting platforms that will beam energy to ground-based stations as an alternative to nuclear. That's how you get solar but without the land mass that it takes for solar collectors. So it's much more efficient to collect it in space without atmosphere and then beam that in a laser through the atmosphere rather than letting the sunlight get dispersed over wide areas. That way you don't have to deal with clouds because you're collecting the solar energy above the clouds. That'll be the basis of that scam. And then he's got the whole supply chain for that. He's got the rockets that can put it into orbit. He's got the satellite technology, which he's rolling out with the Internet, the Starlink series. And he's got the storage with Tesla batteries and the wall-mounted Tesla battery. And so he will position himself as the energy sector. And that could be, you know, the justification for Tesla's stock price uh, as a proxy for that whole SpaceX um solution so that's the that's the assessment of energy and then finance finance is a no-brainer because the big banks own the world and they own the governments that own the world so they own the world and and they their argument is that only they can provide the kind of stability in between regimes and administrations that allows a regular um uh, economic oscillation to occur under management that way you separate it from politics they own the politicians so you change the politicians but as long as the bank ownership remains the same then you have certain stability in capital markets and that's that so they will pitch that as protecting democracy so if you think about those four sectors xlk xle xlf and xlk those are the drivers of change for the future. Now, who are the other ones? You have consumer staples and consumer discretionary. Staples is always going to be driven by pure efficiency. If you want consumer staples, just buy Amazon because he's going to end up owning all of that and the delivery mechanism driving Tesla vehicles. So Amazon is a pure play on consumer staples because they can drive down the commodity prices and uh, squeeze, they, they would maximum efficient. So you're not going to make money in a, any other individual companies. Stay with Amazon on that one. And then consumer discretionary is simply tied directly to um, what the Fed's going to pump for uh, government guaranteed income. So XLY is going to always kind of oscillate according to political cycles and who's going to pay off the most. And that leaves healthcare XLV, and it's hard to see the profit motive that's going to let people emerge from there because I don't see any way around, um, you know, uh, government-owned solutions and treating, you know, healthcare as the utility. So I think XL, XLV is going to look more like utilities. It's going to be an aggressive utilities and then some of the dividends that are paid if that you get public ownership then those will get rolled back into social security um just like a you buy utilities as a sector for the dividends and then we'll own publicly all those farms pharmaceuticals and uh, and healthcare delivery and then any earnings get plowed back into long-term retirement so i think they're kind of off the table in terms of sustained growth so i think they're a cyclic company um, but this is prompted by just the the sense of closure that i get by us coming to this point in the um in the strategic cycle for price so if the sell-off from one two three each one of those ten percent chunks um happened in five to seven days this is also the argument for the ten percent stop for the longer term core positions because the point of a 10% sell uh, stop loss is to protect against two more chunks and so you'll notice that if you 
had the 10% trailing stop, you would have gotten hit at um, that first pink line at number one, and then would have missed the pain of two and three. And then if your re-entry, your tactical re-entries allow you to start participating in four, five, and six, you can protect the core competencies um, with tactical plays. You protect the core, your core positions with um, with this 10% stop right here, which protects you, you know, that 10% sell-off gives you room, but it protects you against this horrible experience, which is two scoops short. That's the argument for a 10% stop. It's wide enough that routine noise doesn't get you out, but close enough that it protects you against this kind of, um, this kind of major malfunction. So if the sell-off, each of those periods is a 10% chunk, and they happen at about the same amount of time. You know, this one happened basically like this. This one happened in almost the same period of time. And then this one happened in about the same period of time. But then these, these rebounds... Ticks one, two, and five. That's how long that takes. So the the primary point on all this is to say, look at the importance of of being able to shift your mindset in moments of extreme danger and sell-off and, you know, uh, nuclear, nuclear war, that kind of stuff. This um, standard work during abnormal times. And these were hard decisions about getting back in. And there's the supported spring crossing and then a series of trades that we then the Z3 breakout, that one was significant. Yeah, Ken, isn't this really two different periods in here? I could, I suppose, I could make that argument if you wanted to make that argument that this this is really two chunks in which um, that first blue box gave back as much as it gained. And it's really only the second blue box that had the follow through to get back to where the previous blue box had gained. You know, all we've done in the last 30 days is going from here to the sell off and then recovery back to that same price level. And so now we got to find. So what's it going to be now? Is it going to be another? Is it going to be another one of these? Or is it going to be one of these? It's hard to see how, you know, you get higher than the previous all-time high. Doesn't mean it can't happen, you know. But uh, dang, man, how do you how do you get better than that given the current circumstance? What kind of discounting current risk against future gains is that? I can almost make the argument why the rebound, you know, to me the the rebound to here is legit, which gets you back to the fair value. It's everything after this. It's all the blue boxes that I just don't I can't fathom. And that's sort of what the RL270 as a guide makes you think about. Now, am I treating that as real and it's just a nominalization and I'm projecting onto there? Well, it's, an, it's a 
analytical lens, that's for sure. So how do I get, how do you get from there all the way up to here? And voting starts in six weeks in some states. So XLK tech, long-term no-brainer. So now if you want to specialize in tech, so if we said um, XLK, XLE, XLF, and XLB as the drivers of long-term change. And we said maybe the things that are going to be cyclic are going to be that um, XLP staples, XLY discretionary, XLV. Healthcare. You could then come down and look at um, if you were going to play XLK, you might as well be looking at TQQQ or TECL as the triple leveraged version of that in terms of specializing. And then if you were going to play XLE, you know, for energy, um, I think you got to think of Tesla in there. And then if you're thinking of health uh, uh, consumer Discretion. Here's why Amazon is so darn cool. Um, Amazon is a combination of consumer discretionary and consumer staples. That's what he is. And you might as well treat him as an entire sector all into himself. All right, so what we've just done for about 40 minutes is a strategy session of long-term thinking where we are, and I'm trying to expose my thinking visually to a circle of trust and to think about some of these different ideas as a way to protect myself and therefore us against my own you know, inner inner lenses. So I'm trying to expose my my sense making lenses to discussion and debate. So there's that's risk management. So Van talks a lot about, you know, beware your beliefs and assumptions and as if that is only inner work for psychology. If you get the inner psychology about yourself wrong, and I don't know how you would know that until it's too late, you can offset that risk with dialogue, discourse, trusted others, critical thinking circles, and multiple frames of reference, the six blind men and the elephant. So I guess the one blind man could try to make himself really, really good and understand his own psychology as well. He's, he's trying to understand the elephant. Now he's also got to understand himself. Is understanding yourself any different than understanding an elephant? If you're using a single point of view to study your own psychology, haven't you just replaced the elephant with yourself? But if six blind guys can collaborate and learn something about that elephant, the composite elephant from six different angles. Isn't that better than six individual knowledges of the elephant? And so that's one of the reasons we survived and became apex predators and top of the food chain is because of our tribal affiliation. So there is a real survival interest and a risk management interest of cultivating members of your team and your tribe in order to ensure that you have a wide range of perspectives represented 
and where ideas can be explored and contested, not for the sake of winning or losing with who has the best idea, but in order to improve the idea that is on the table for discussion. And that's why it's important that you have the courage to put your ideas out there and then treat each other with, you know, um, rigorous compassion so that we're rigorous about the ideas and then compassionate with each other as humans with emotions and so that we can recognize the act of courage that it takes to put ideas out there and to venture. Um, you know, so I took a risk in this last 45 minutes of having you think I'm, you know, I'm out of my mind going on a sort of a wandering trip through self-discovery out loud and in public, but that's the risk I'm willing to take in order to expose my thinking about this stuff in order to get feedback and, and dialogue with us. Uh, and also to just to illustrate some ideas about how um, ideas that, that have uh, survived contact with the market for going on 40 years and um, so that harsh sell-offs, 10% chunks, five to seven days, a 10% trailing stop protects you against that contingency. That's happened three times in the last 10 years, five times in the last 20. And every one of them cratered people's retirement accounts. If they, what if you sold, what if you were a bitter ender and you sold at three and you haven't gotten back in yet because you've learned that the market is not a safe space. And now you look at this and you say, oh crap, I got to get back in. That's fourth or fifth mouse. If you buy above the top level, if you buy, if you're buying at seven right here, you are a fourth mouse. Like if this is where you start your buying at seven, you are a fourth mouse. If you buy at eight, when it breaks out, you are a fifth mouse. If you buy at nine, like you want to see it get some, I don't even know what you, what you would call it. So I, I want to get confirmation that it's leaving the, you know, let me, let me draw that box for you. If you're waiting for confirmation that it's cleared, you know, the previous high by some distance, and now you're buying at nine, you're like a sixth mouse. You're not even on, you know, you'll never buy But if you listen to the nightly podcasts, uh, which started back there in that last week of February, every night, and you can see how we managed through each of these different boxes and how we made money on the way down in one, two, and three, and money on the way up in four, five, and six. Uh, and what we're thinking about now, what what I'm thinking about now at seven is what I just got done saying here. Um, man. I have no conclusions right now, but the table is set. Put a note in the. In the chat box, if you found that to be useful. I sure did. It cleared my mind. Because, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, I made a decision back right at about um, at this yellow dot. Um, right in here, I think it was, was to shift my core portfolio away from equities and into cash and treasuries. And so I'm really content with that because those core positions enjoyed this entire move. Uh, from yellow dot to yellow dot. And the point of diminishing returns felt like it was right in there. And uh, 
I'm not as worried about potential losses between there and eight. And that's what I got swing and day trading for, which is still enjoying these these moves, but taking that risk off the table. That puts that decision in a longer term context. And then I'm just going to say, remember, uh, we've got a major event coming in the form of a, um, you know, in, in the form of the election. That thing's coming, and you got. You have that uncertainty and you have COVID uncertainty. And I'm going to also say uh, social unrest, you know, the, the rioting in the streets and all that. So three major sources of uncertainty um, going forward. Um, and that puts the, uh, you know, the gains here in, in a larger perspective. Yeah, so I, yeah, I would, uh, Stephen said, yeah, we're in a critical state. I, I would say so. So let's dial it down to the tactical. Now, this is probably a time, to, this is, this is operational. This is strategic now, too. So this is the one I drew today. So I, I think of like three, uh, you know, time time frames. You know, each one of these is its own kind of um, environment or ecosystem. And there's times when, right here in the middle, and this is probably I, I should probably write this in. This is probably I'm going to say two thirds of the time. And this is probably one sixth. And this is probably one sixth of the time over here. So if you think that that's sort of like um, that's that a simplified bell curve. Uh, Eugene, that idea about the uh, six six blind men and the elephant, and then replacing the elephant with ourself, and then comparing individual psychological work versus group collaborative process. Don't let me lose that idea. That is really important. That's the argument for the tribal approach, and choose your tribe wisely. I don't know if I can overemphasize the importance of that. The six blind man, the elephant, and yourself. That is really good. I've never actually said it that way or had that thought in exactly that way, but I just made a really strong connection in my own head. I really think that's important now. That's the argument for collaborative learning environment. and why we need a common language in order to differentiate between a useful concept and something that we believe to be true. You know, you could just stop and say, oh, well, everything's just nominalizations and then discount it. Or you could say, no, I understand the difference between a nominalization, which is a true belief in a belief or faith in a belief and a useful concept for purposes of discussion a common frame of reference in the public sphere in the public sphere you know i've got a really good diagram to show on that one i just i just created in my head and i'm going to show that one next so anyway two thirds of the time i'm just going to stipulate we because we can define this is really a combination of the rlco framework and the bollinger band framework that when you have normal oscillation within you know, plus or minus one, and you get, you know, market is up, it rolls over, it's down, and it recovers, and you get this normal. And then you can argue whether or not that, that's probably got a 2% slope up, right? You know, if I were to draw that 
to scale, if I took a look at the long-term secular gains in the market, it, you know, if I'm being honest, I would, or precise, you know, we would probably draw that as, um, you know, we would say this probably has a slight upward tilt, right? The long-term real gains after inflation and taxes, 2%. But within those periods of time, you get that kind of that big oscillation. Um, you know, you have you have this, and you have something like that. You know, so it's uh, if we were drawing arrows, it'd probably be uh, you know these green gains on the way up. And, and these things on the way down. So maybe I should just draw that as, uh, I should draw those two as probably purple. Yeah, that's too harsh. Blue. You know, and that's sort of the idea behind the RL10 stretching away from that long-term fair value. Well, you get it, you're getting the same ideas here. And we saw the magnitude of those moves. Um, you know, that's the Trump economy, or I'm not going to call it the economy. It's really the Trump stock market, not to be confused with actual productivity. And then you have this. That's the thir that right there is the thirty percent uh, sell off, and so maybe this was the. You know we're almost we're like right about there right now. If I were to draw that fairly, and so that's sort of a uh, you take the time equation out of there, just look at magnitudes of moves. That's kind of what it's like. So two thirds of the time you're kind of in this normal period. And that dominates the back-tested models of long look-back periods because the market is in that period most of the time. That's where most rule sets come from that are exhaustively back-tested. And they discount this period of time over here, which is sort of maximum volatility. And... Uh, you know, these this periods of massive quietude when you have a market that is in this um, sideways quiet channel kind of stuff, this kind of stuff. And if you put a 2%, you know, gain on that one, you probably get something like that. And so we know that... Um, any quiet market is good. You almost never see a bear quiet. So it's sideways quiet is positive and bull quiet is very good. And what dominates in that period of time, because the market is so flat, um, you really have to find, you have to drill down deeper to find out, well, what are the sectors that are working? And so you might see something, this is just a notional one, but the, the four I just talked about, this idea of XLF, the financials could be in the orange, could, or no, uh, XLK or the Qs, you know, the tech could be leading the way, but then the tech bubble could burst, and then the tech could lead, the new generation tech could lead you out of the old disaster in much the same way that Tesla is doing that now. Or you might have banks that are going through periods of a Fed pumping, and so these guys are locked in and their earnings are great, and then freaking disasters, and they give shitty loans and or terrible loans, and then they start. To, so you get 
the financial sector cycling out of phase with tech. And then you might have energy geared towards economic activity and the price of oil and geopolitics. So you get a really wild cycling in energy. You don't need to be told that. And then materials, a longer, slower, uh, you know, the basic materials companies that are manufacturing industrial strength solutions for a global wholesale economy. So when the market is really flat but has a slightly upward tilt, you want to you got to be looking for which sector is in ascendancy and then how far does it have to give back? Like about at this point, you wanted to be, as we start going through this period of time here, let's start thinking about, you know, where we would want to be. You got to start thinking about, um, you know, time as a, as a moving, uh, as a moving window here. So if you can start plotting that oscillation uh, through time. See, well, tech is right about now, tech is in the ascendancy and is leading the way and it's pulling the market up. So, you know, you get you get that kind of breakout. You kind of want to buy tech. And then somewhere there's some trailing stop where you've you see some kind of sniper exit, you know, where you, you want to take that exit. And then you're noticing that, hey, uh, you know, energy is really cheap and on sale and uh, has shown evidence as the second mouse of maybe this is where I got to start buying um, XLE in the spring or an owl entry, right? supported spring crossing kind of a deal and maybe if I can if I can afford to be short maybe I wanted to be short XLE and then at some point after some transition period I can be I can think about getting long energy oops I can think about getting long energy with one or two scoops, you know, until I've seen the far side of the hill in energy. Dang it, come on, Ken. And in the same way, you know, I'm thinking about XLB and trying to play that inside his inside his cycle. And then XLF, maybe I'm just getting ready to stalk this. You know, it's right in here. So maybe somewhere in here, I'm stalking at the bottoms of these places, right? I'm going through this kind of, this these kinds of sequences on the curve. And maybe, maybe I'm, Maybe I'm short, you know, tech to here, and maybe I'm short, you know, materials to there, and, uh, you know, in, in short materials here, in short um, finance there, something like that. So, uh, you know, how many sectors do you have to play? I think if you've got those four, you're in pretty good shape. So now I've got, I've got this notion of taking a look at each one of these guys in their life cycle moves, right? So I'm playing tech until it no longer makes sense to play tech, and then I'm short tech. So at the top of these, at all of these, there's sort of some, some area where you're in the warning zone. Because one of the things we'll remember is when you're in that critical state, and I'm going to show this, strictly as uh, like energy and maybe tech right here in these cycles that after that first scoop and you're back to fair value and it's back to parity this thing could just as easily have come south out of here um, as easily as it could have gone north 
because in every critical state, at the moment of decision, that thing could have gone long or short, right? So as we start moving moving forward in time, hey, I'm ready to, I'm long energy because the risk is so low, because if that thing fails, I'm just going to play the collapsing dragon, right? That's easy, because now I get two scoops short. We don't, we're not worried about that. But instead, it broke out and went to the upside. That's the SSC, or the OWL. And um, that's why if the, I actually like when the OWL fails or the SSC fails, because then my preferred target is better. So this is the essence that when you have an exceptionally flat market, which is what the last time period has looked like. So if we come back in here, we take a look at that larger scale. In this blue period, you know, like Picasso in the blue period, right? That market hasn't really done much. And but what has worked inside there is oscillations between energy has been great and then it has been horrible and then it has been great and then it has been horrible. And now it's just starting to get great again. And finances like that. And um, uh, we're at so this period of in six, this sideways, exceptionally flat market, you know, we've seen the volatility come way out of the market. So it looks more. That blue period looks like this. That's where we've been. And this normal oscillation period is looking like this. And then this combination over in here is we want to be, we're ready to go in either direction and play these, these big oscillations that, you know, it's when it goes below, it's short and that's almost like the you could think of you could think of this line right here uh, as the zero line. Think of that as the zero line in the MACD and the seasonality of it. And the shorter your time frame, the more you love that volatility. And now you're getting moves of, you know, uh, one, two, three sigma, and then a rollover, and then three sigma all the way back, and then three sigma down, and then three sigma up. And those wild rides become more about momentum plays than any fundamental truth that you could find, any objective fundamental truth about the economy, because there's too much hedging of global portfolios going on, which is dominating the market than any longer term stable. What everybody wants is this period of time here, this two thirds of the time, when we can attribute the flow to logical news and nobody's getting hurt too bad, but you can accumulate advantage over time if you can get these timing signals right and things are just going according to long term norms. But when it goes like this, all of the models that were built, when you step over the line into these volatile markets, all those models that are built on this two thirds of the normal time break because all the correlations change. And then when the market is in this kind of quietude, the amount that long term buy and holders are winning or losing doesn't really matter and it doesn't really alter the rule set so they can almost discount this and because there is an upward the bias upward is even stronger because of the absence of volatility that almost just reinforces this period so what you want to do in this period of time or find those sector leaders that are working and then just get them and then while they're giving you abnormal returns ride them and then when they start stalling go into your profit preservation mode. You don't even have to play it short, but as long as you can find broad sectors that are making these turns, that OWL and the SSC become your friends, and now you have a timing model that helps you do sector cycling. In this period of time, 
the two thirds of the time, you've got market cycling. The broad market itself is going through periods of gains and excess of gains, and then possible reversions and then excessive losses and then recovery to fair value. And so you got this normal sine wave going on in here. So there may there's an opportunity with the shorter term trading to with turbo trading to take advantage of a cycling market. And then there will still be the sectors that are pulling it north and south. And so the techniques that you refine over in this area with sector cycling help you, but now you've got the added advantage of getting the market contribution as well. And then here, this is, this is um, really abnormal. This is where that shorter term and this is why I got out of that, those core positions after that unbelievable 50, 60 day gain, which was the best in history. I said, how much more did I think was fair to squeeze out of that stone, you know? And now I'm just concentrating on the volatility plays right now. So when the market is wild, that's where things like the lead sector really does matter. And that's why I, you see me spending the time thinking about these four sectors primarily, because if I can get the market right and then four sectors, that's five objects to study in comparison. I feel like I get most of the value of sector cycling with just four pieces. And you could add VXX in there, if you will. And then you'll notice that each one of those sectors has a turbo play on it. So like in tech, for me, it's TQQ or T uh, ELC. Uh, and then in um, finance, it's FAS, FAZ. In materials, I just have been enjoying the uh, those steel companies and the metals companies, but you could play that. And then XLE, you can play with uh, SCO, the triple leveraged or the ERX, ER, ERY, or Devon Energy and those kinds of things. And then Wheaton as an alternative. So Wheaton works as a defensive play when you see the market peak and start. This is where gold, silver, and all the defensive plays, and that's why Wheaton Precious Metals is kind of its own thing for me. And Wheaton has been very good in this period of time here. It's crazy good and still good. And just because, and now that the market is pushing to that all-time high, again, it's getting into that critical state. That's, you know, now while it's up in here, that's why you see Wheaton uh, being postured as a, people are buying Wheaton as a, downside protection against this big sell-off in here. Because if we go look at Wheaton, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I mean, could it be clearer than that? There's a lot of people playing wheat, and it was up three and a half percent today. Um, that's about the best strategy thinking I can give you in 90 minutes with some, I think, solutions. Those are strategies. Those are not systems. But strategies is the way you start getting your arms around complexity in a robust way and gives you multiple pathways out of the fog. Just had a really interesting picture come into my head. I want to draw. There's two pictures I need to draw. We're going to get to the daily report here, but if you, this, the daily report's the daily. This feels fundamental to me. Let 
I hope you agree. But I just can't talk about tactical stuff in, in this particular moment. Um, so the first one, I got to get out of my head. Is the is the elephant problem? So if we are, and this is for uh, Eugene. So if we call that thing the elephant, elephant, oh, and uh, you got the six blind. Six blind guys around him. So each guy only knows that little piece of the elephant. And yeah, so no single one of those guys knows the deal with the elephant. And you could even argue, you know, so one guy knows this much about the elephant. But if you take the intersection of six guys, the union of six guys, they know that much about the elephant. You know, so at some point, they're going to know enough about that elephant that the amount that we don't know about the elephant becomes less and less important as you start getting more and more. Now, how do you get how do you get to this? You got to talk to somebody, which means that you need a language and you need concepts, grammar, trust, empathy. You need a tribe. You need some courage and respect. Don't you need all those things to get to the objective of understanding the elephant? If you want to get to there, you got to have all of those preconditions. Look how many things could go wrong. Otherwise, what you have is a set of six little trivial pieces of the of the elephant, and none of them gives you any kind of insight about that. You're not building a mosaic unless these guys can all start talking to each other. What ties all these things together? Language. And ultimately, this builds a body of knowledge. And that thing evolves through time. So we've got to have rules for that, how it gets better. You know what's a pretty good set of rules? Shingo. Kaizen. Gemba. Continuous process improvement. That's how you do it. Well, now here's the moment of Zen. <laughs> now, 
if I spend any time trying to perfect um, If this was me, and I spent time trying to perfect my ability to uh, see and understand, so all my research is trying to expand my little knowledge of the, you know, I'm trying to expand my understanding of the elephant. But it's kind of coming from, you know, this perspective, right? So the more I understand about the elephant, I'm filling up my head with good elephant knowledge, whatever. You know, I'm crowding up. Then the inside of my head at some point looks like, well, this much about the elephant and this much not elephant. And my head's only so big. So actually, the more I'm learning about elephants, maybe the less room there is for all those other things because they only get so much time. And my brain, although vast, is a vast empty space. Right? Well, if this is in the world of psychology down here, if you only try to pick one element of psychology, I think, in order to understand yourself, which one of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, which one of those ways of understanding yourself, which one of those lenses do you want to use to understand yourself and unpack all that? Isn't that is the same problem? or the same situation as the elephant. You've just replaced the elephant with yourself. And what we've seen here, what is the equivalent of this, of this in the world of understanding yourself? Do you wanna guess which one of these is the right one? How are you going to prove that forever and ever and always works for you? Are there competing ways of doing that? Sure, there are. So the tribe helps here. The tribe helps here. The tribe helps there. And so what matters is this. These things that you're bringing to the endeavor. This is where gains are made. This is why the collaborative learning environment matters. And this is why I try to discourage you from just uh, trading like me. I'm 62. Some, something just happened when I clicked that button inadvertently. It's zeroing out the pen. God damn it. Jiminy crickets. Yeah, that makes me angry. I'll get that pen back. Shoot. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say, but I had to get that idea out of my head. Um, so trading is no different 
than understanding yourself and understanding the elephant. But for me, the big moment of Zen was this idea about the insight to self and why the, the power of the tribe and the collaborative learning groups helps you understand the elephant, helps you understand trading, helps you understand the self. But now you got to invest in these pieces here to build the useful scaffolding and architecture that gets you to these um, larger, um, larger spaces. So I don't know why that's not. Anyway, that's uh, that's that. Now, what was the other one I was going to cover? Shoot, that just displaced a really good idea. I can't remember what it was. All right, let's go to the daily. suffered enough um so here we are Oh, I know what I have to do. And I gotta go back to the. Uh... We haven't done the tactical play yet. All right. Yeah. So, uh, so today now we're now we're down into tactical time. The big excursion. Monday, Tuesday pushed to a new 10 day high, 30 day high, sold off, but is still above. It's got a 5% range on the 10 day. All of our extensions are positive. So the 30 period RL10, the RL30 has rolled up and is pointing the way significantly higher. The Dragon extension is powerful and up. The PSAR flipped back here and is just marching north and that's kind of our third layer of defense if you will so that's really good um we got the um this 10 day regression line here that's really good we are deep in the um, um we are well into the summer on MACD four seasons. It went from winter to spring to summer. There's your supported spring crossing. There's your PSAR stop. And this is just powerful and moving. Um, support to the or, uh, resistance to the upside, the RL90. So if we get another one of these days, You know, these grinding upward days have been about that size. So if we get another one, that gets us to the RL90. A second one gets us to the Z3 excursion. And that's pretty good. A, um, a sell-off of double that. Because the sell-off is sharper, right? Uh, would get us to something like this, down to support at the edge of the dragon. And two of those would get us to the Bollinger Band mean. So we're, we're postured pretty well to the upside. Um, we've got support levels now at the low of the day. The dragon top skin at 321.50. The spine at 319, the southern skin, bottom skin at 318, um, the PSAR 
at 314, Bollinger Band Mean at 313 and a half, 10 day low at 310 and a half. That's still going to be the 10 day low for one more day, but then it only comes up to here. So that's going to be, you know, that's two big chunks away. Z1, long term fair value, Z2, belly of the dragon here belly of the rl10 so this is all systems go but the air starting to get thin up in here so measured moves don't be surprised by those shocks remember here's what a 10 percent sell-off might look like so with price here at uh, 325 a 10 percent sell-off is 32 dollars That's what a 10% sell-off looks like right there. Like if it went from the high. So how long would it how long could it take to do that? Well, we saw five to seven days. That could happen, you know, on the downside in five to seven days. So that kind of sell-off would, it would have to be some kind of angle like that, right? That's what that would look like. And that comes all the way back over here to, oh, all the way to the long-term fair value. Is that allowed, by definition, is that even allowed to be unusual or unbelievable? No. A return to long-term fair value? You know, I know what I'll do on that one. Man, I'll make money on that one. Probability of that is greater than, in my view, if I had to put probabilities on it, than this kind of move. And that's pushing a Z3 up there. So let's just keep that in mind. What worked today? You know, I'm going to have to go back and listen to that again so I can remember what that other sketch was that I was going to draw. Well, I, I should have written that down. I had the pen in my hand, too. Dang, damn it. So the S&P was up 0.2, diamonds were up 0.6, uh, IWM up 1.4. So this is um, speculative winners. Um, the sectors that won, your materials up 0.9, um, finance up 2, Brazil and Mexico up 2 and 2.6, um, energy up big. What was worse? Uh, discretionary about healthcare, slightly red tech, minus one. So today was energy and materials. Energy and materials were the winners today. Look at all the big names in tech that did not contribute today. Twitter lost money, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Tesla, Tesla down 4%, Amazon down 2%. Does that fill you with uh, joy? Or does that suggest this? Is energy likely to put in another day like that today to drag this higher? Could be. Maybe tech is just on sale. So tech was big. Tech was big yesterday and everything was normal. And today tech got smashed. <clears throat> so that's not an unbridled tech resurgence. That's tech cycling. So this looks more like um, 
these wild plays over in here. And when the lead sector is switching back and forth between energy today and tech tomorrow and each one getting smashed on each successive day, that feels more like a frothy market that is just being driven by tactical manipulations and tactical oscillations than some kind of normal steady progression through a business cycle. So let's be on our guard and manage our risk accordingly. So we've already been through that. So let's let's see where we are. It's all going to look wonderful today. Hey, uh, awesome. Bullish normal. Everything is deeply overbought. Who's left to buy? 5% above sideways. ADX is slowly getting better. It's 12.8 now. It's still weak, but bulls are in charge. Um, ADX is at 1.5%. Two weeks ago, that was at 2.5. Risk Z starting to uh, overheat a little bit, but this is that long side swing is still unfolding. Hasn't become dangerous yet, but getting closer. The big winners today were the big one day winners, Chevron, Cisco, big losers, Amazon, Goldman. Those were the two big winners yesterday. In the Dow summary, just a handful of dojis. Goldman and Pfizer, kind of like Goldman there as a, as a doji. That looks pretty good on Goldman right there. He's uh, green in every time frame. No other signals to speak of, but 3.2 to 1. Goldman. We're so close to the 10-day high that nobody except Goldman has an auto framer that's any good. Um, I still think Microsoft and Apple, we got to be, we can be turbo trading those intraday and collecting some gains to fund a swing trade. Yeah, energy had a good one day pump. That's why you're interested in these on one day pumps. Eh? It's 7%. Why not? Nobody tests out well on the auto framer among the ETFs. Again, just a handful of dojis. Um, today it was energy and oil exploration and silver, and that's where wheat and precious comes comes into play. Silver up six percent today. Maybe I should sell my start selling some of that silver coinage. Nah, that's for the kids. Silver and Walmart and Pfizer well stretched above their river. Silver is just on a tear. Wheat and precious metals. The U.S. indices are tightly within their little river above the zero line, but not out of the river yet. So that's still healthy. I like treasuries here in a it's approaching the super pinch and healthcare. Goldman. We've seen so much Goldman in here tonight. Kind of kind of like Yep, nice. There's the trade. It's got a nice tight compression. 
and support level in here and a push to the 10 day high. That's the only thing in the Dow that looks like that. That's nice. But then if it breaks down, you like it coming back to, um, you know, the PSAR. So that's in pretty good shape right there. Liking that. Feel about correct? It should. Yep. And it ended today in a doji right on the northern skin of the dragon. That's going to be a good trade tomorrow. It's finance's turn. Finance was up pretty big today, but Goldman didn't really didn't really help. So finance hasn't really broken out of their little box yet. but put in a good one day performance. So watch for finance tomorrow, Goldman. That's, that could be good. The RLFF. Nothing really jumps out at me. So, you know, Home Depot's kind of been looking pretty good. I, I sort of like Intel for some reason. I like that. Plenty to choose from here on the one day, on the one day daily squeezes. Um, there you go, right there, right in the middle. SPY, Russell, Treasuries. Um, this is a market condition of compression, and uh, we're getting ready for a big move in either direction. I'm afraid it's going down, but I'm ready to follow price. I don't have a directional bias, but I'm leaning uh, probability-wise. I'd say the, down, the downside would be least surprising. I'll put it that way. Um, energy and finance, when they're in the spring, that means that they have room to that upside to really explode. Whereas tech has already moved up in the summer. And, um, you know, consumer discretionary is already fully valued and healthcare and staples are doing well. I kind of like Goldman. He's in the summer, so that means there's no fear, but still plenty of room to go. And I just think this is an opportunity. Like if you got a 10 or 15 year time horizon, why wouldn't you be buying Amazon on sale? I need to be buying more Amazon, I guess. I spend so much money there. Yeah, I think um, I'm ready for that. I mean, I've been neglecting Home Depot, and I don't know why. Look how strong it is. It's just been consistently strong. Why have I not been catching that sooner? This is just going to make us sick.
Yeah, I mean, look at that. He's already well out of his, uh, you know, that all-time high over there before. This is bad form on my part. I should have been, I should have been on him like right there. That's just, uh, boy, you just got to like that. You got to buy some more of that with a stop at the PSR. That's what strength looks like. You know, and he, he, uh, his previous peak right here. Yeah, I think you got to buy that. Home Depot. Hmm. I suppose if you were a, uh, you know, you're drawing triangles, you'd probably say, look at that triangle right there. Well, you'd say something like this and this. And he broke out to the upside with power. And off he goes, Home Depot. That's the kind of stuff that we should, we got to be able to see inside these. So Johnson & Johnson is kind of getting like that. Nike. Um, Walmart has been good here. And just, it's that last little piece where he's had the pullback. Those are nice breakouts. Consumer discretionary has been great. So this NDX will help you see from a wide range of choices like that. That'll get that'll let, allow you to see from a wide range of choices um, this this sector cycling phenomenon where we talked about trying to catch these guys in different different moments in their wave of leading and lagging and trying to find them when they're lagging and then not failing so much and then starting to regenerate and then breaking out and become, becoming winners and riding the wave while there's both of those extremes create opportunities for um, outsized performance. So that's what I want to say about that. That's probably enough on the daily. Um, uh, there were good markups in the room today. I feel like our cup is overflowing. That's two hours. I didn't mean to go that long. Um, but there's a lot to chew on. And I got to go find out what that other sketch was. I can't remember what I was talking about. I wonder if this is ready to work now. And now it works. I don't get it. Okay. Anyway, that's everything I wanted to cover. I'll get that other sketch made. Uh, I'm going to turn that one about the elephant trading and psychology into a really nice flashcard. I, I really think that's a big idea. So, Eugene, keep me straight on that one. All right, guys, take good care, and we're going to see you um, in the chat room tomorrow.